Good evening. I'm Bob Trask. I'm the senior minister at Unity of Vancouver. Unity of Vancouver. This is the home of common sense spirituality. This is where the people come who have finally found that there's an urgency inside of them that's not being fulfilled by other religions or other dogmas, where they want to come and be able to discuss the deeper things inside of them and to find like-minded people who feel that love, as we do, is the most powerful force in the world. Tonight, I am so excited because this is one of the most special nights of the year for Unity of Vancouver and for many of us, not only in Vancouver, but around the world. A special, very, very special evening of music, something that you'll not ever forget, something that very well might change your life. So I'm now going to ask Janet Law to please introduce our incredible guest for this evening. Janet. Thank you so much, Bob. And I'm so glad that you've all joined us this evening for a very special evening. The most generous heart of Stephen Halpern, um, he said that he would like to do a benefit concert because unity has been such a big part of his life. And we are so grateful in advance, Stephen, for what you not only bring to the global world, but what you're bringing here tonight at Unity of Vancouver. We also want to thank as well Banyan Books and Sound, who always are such incredible supporters of what uh, we do here at Unity of Vancouver. And we've done many events in the past, and we thank you as well in advance. So what I'd like to do now, though, is introduce the man, the artist, the musician, the sound healer, the incredible, incredible talent and abilities of an individual who came into the world to make a difference. And not only that, but to actually expand people's consciousness. Stephen Halpern is a Grammy nominated multi-platinum selling record artist, composer, producer, and pioneering sound healer. His music had touched the hearts of millions worldwide, radiating vibrations of love, balancing chakras, and uplifting body, mind, and spirit. Stephen was John Bradshaw's musician in residence from 1988 to 1994, accompanying John on tour and providing the soundtrack for John's meditations and workshops. Stephen's recordings are used in classrooms, ADD and ADHD settings, hospitals and corporate wellness programs, as well as massage therapy offices. Stephen's Deep Alpha was a Grammy nominee and his Chakra Suite, formerly Spectrum Suite, was voted the most influential New Age healing album of all time. And so we now introduce Mr. Stephen Halpern. Thank you, Janet. And hello, everyone. All righty. What we're going to be sharing this evening will be some live speaking, some questions and answers, some suggestions, and then some videos. What we won't be able to do is live performance because I'm not set up like John Legend or, or Garth Brooks with a home recording studio that would give you quality sound. And I've always been about quality sound. The recordings are top quality sound. So we will be featuring some of those as we go through the evening. And as we introduce the first piece, the first selection, let me suggest that as you get as comfortable as you can in your seats, wherever you're viewing this, one of the ways to enhance your hearing apparatus, one of the ways to actually hear better, to hear deeper into the music, uh, part of what I call how to listen, is 
to simply take a deep breath and hold it for 20 seconds. So for all of us right now, let us just take a deep breath and hold it. If, you, if you're a smoker, you might not be able to make 20 seconds, but you'll find out how long 20 seconds can seem. But that allows your body to reset and make more effective use of its internal energy, but also is an easy way to begin to balance both hemispheres of your brain, which in turn gives you more access to hear more. And as we listen to the first selection, which is actually entitled Eastern Peace, coming from my 1978 album, involving modes and scales typically associated with Japan and China, the concept uh, of the space between the notes is paramount. So as you listen to the main notes that I play, listen also in the pauses, because as you tune in, you may hear extra little melodies in the sustained harmonics as I hold down the piano pedal and allow the notes to blend. Uh, for me, this was similar to in Indian music where the tambura begins uh, to set the stage and then the hypnotic effect of the continuous flow and the wash of overtones shifts your consciousness from what we call normal beta consciousness about uh, 13 to 39 cycles per second, we get your brain waves slower into the alpha wave. So this first selection will definitely start you off into that realm. And I think with that introduction, I won't say more, we'll just take it. And when you have questions, you can write them down. There will be times uh, to get those to me later on. But right now, just be. There's nothing you need to do right now. You just need to be. There's nowhere else you need to go. Uh, you didn't have to travel 100 miles to get to the concert in person. You're comfortable, you're safe, and here we go. Yes, you can feel the energy building. Thank you for being here and being part of this this evening, because this involves you too. I'm just up here tickling the ivories. Well, not just, but uh, yeah, it's good for me. Okay, so this next song is a theme that I often perform. It's related to the original album, Eastern Peace, oh. Inner Peace, and World Peace. So. For all those on this wonderful solstice evening, here we go. Om Shanti Om. Mm.
And as you listen, particularly in this mode, you can really begin to hear into the spaces between the notes and go into totally being in the moment not knowing where the music is going to go next, because neither do I. So a totally mindful music. In the gaps between thoughts, as Deepak Chopra and Dio departed in transition, but still around Wayne Dyer, speaking about the gap between thoughts and the power of intention and really taking more control for orchestrating our own lives even more necessary in the current reality
Okay. So let me try to speak after that uh, performance. A couple of things that were going on here. Number one, you notice that there's a lot of improvisation because that's my background as a jazz musician and being open in the moment, not predicting where things will necessarily be going, but open to the flow. And uh, that's how that performance winds up being different than many performances, but also it allows me when I'm playing live with an audience to feel the energy. And some of you might've noticed some of my hand movements. While I'm at the piano, particularly when the lid is open, we had a new sound engineer that day and he didn't have the lid open, but I can actually feel the sound waves. And there've been times when I could physically move them with my hands. And when I share them out with the audience, the people in the first several rows said, I can't believe it, but I could feel the sound waves in that sustained vibration. And that's what I was talking about with the echo and the sustained harmonics. That's the si That's as close to musical silence to absolute silence as you can get. And that's the space that I get into in the studio, uh, in concert where creativity just flows in where the music flows in. And as you listen, it forces you in a sense to be in the moment. And here's the comparison with regular music. So I will sing a pattern that you all have heard millions of times. I'd like you to just feel what's going on in your chest, become aware of your breathing, uh, whether it's deeper or shallower or uh, whatever, and also what you can feel in the temples in your head when I sing this little phrase. The do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. And how many of you can feel a tightness as you're holding your breath? How many of you can feel that note in your head waiting for the, the completion of that phrase? The do at the octave. Well, we all are culturally conditioned to anticipating that note. The problem is when it comes to relaxation and meditation and tuning into your inner being, most music forces you to pay attention out there to the external realities and takes you away from being mindful, being tuned into the present moment by forcing you to be paying attention to the music rather than your own internal energies. And, and that was uh, a discovery I made a long time ago, which I didn't realize at the time was as significant as it was. But when we started doing stress-related research, we found that, that most music, because of this anticipation response, uh, the it's what I call the scaleless interruptus response, where you expect things to go in a certain way, and you're already there. It's like waiting for the other shoe to drop. It puts you out of a relaxation balance state. Great for entertainment, great for many things. But when we need and want to uh, tap into the inner silence, uh, Janet mentioned my work with uh, John Bradshaw. When I met him, in fact, our first performance was literally a few days from now uh, in 1988, July 8, 1988, with no rehearsal. Uh, I was invited to perform with him at Red Rocks Amphitheater outside of Denver in front of 5,000 people. No rehearsal. What could go wrong? But it was absolutely incredible uh, tuning in with that energy and with the space. John, the soul of a poet and a musician, knew how to flow with the uh, notes that I was playing. And as his teachings went more and more public and turned uh, helped so many people find out why they were acting as they were and dealing with the whole area of addiction and uh, recovery. 
one of the things that John said that struck me uh, right away was that uh, people who are alcoholics or in addiction don't know how to access the inner silence. My background in spirituality and uh, meditation was always not coming from a lacking of that, but having read about that, it was always something I wanted to do and was one of the ways that I kept myself sane. It's how I still keep myself sane with moments of tuning into the silence. It's non-denominational and it's something that cultures around the world have known about, but uh, very often forgotten about in our culture. Just lately also, uh, it's, it's been interesting that from my vast archives as I'm working on my memoir, misfiled magazines and articles, interviews with John Bradshaw, just been popping up out of nowhere. Just, just today, this one showed up. And I got, well, I'll show that in, in the concert this evening because working with him and resonating and being amongst people who had never heard of uh, meditation before with audiences that had never heard of the concept of brainwaves, I realized that many people, and that's why we're gonna go into it just a few moments right now, uh, really never got any information on some of the most basic functions of our body, our brain, and how our brain as an electrical organism, you know, our nervous system has electricity, works on that. Our brain is an electrical part of the nervous system. <clears throat> and it pulsates at various frequencies. Scientists have measured that it could be between 13 and 39 cycles per second when we're speaking right now. But when we get slower into uh, light relaxation, early meditation, easy meditation, we're down in the alpha range. When we get deeper, into the deep alpha range. One of the reasons I called my album Deep Alpha was because I added frequencies of sound to act as guide guidances and uh, almost training wheels that will assist you automatically in getting into an alpha state. I would basically say that you cannot listen to my Deep Alpha album and not be in an alpha state because your brain will respond automatically to subtle pulses in the music. So not only is the music uh, composed and recorded when I myself am, am in an alpha state, but on the series of brainwave entrainment albums, we add subtle uh, frequencies in the left channel and the right channel that literally entrain your brain to the desired frequency. I didn't invent that concept. It's been around for many years. I had forgotten, however, that I was writing about this and even had ads that I hadn't seen in 30 years where I was talking about in training the brain. So this, but it was too early in the, in, in the field of new age music and consciousness. Most people didn't understand what we were talking about, but it's something that goes back to cavemen and cave women dancing around the fire, looking at the fire where the flickering light will uh, trigger all, uh, an altered state of consciousness and where your brain waves slow down. The shamanic drumming was about slowing down your brain waves. And the concept of entrainment uh, has two main levels. Entrainment that you can feel at one beat per minute, or what we call beat per minute. This is uh, rhythm entrainment with the beat in music where your heartbeat will automatically match the speed of the music you're listening to. You have no choice. You're, this is your autonomic nervous system. You can't tell your heart, if I were, and I am right now, clapping my hands quickly, your pulse will automatically begin to match that frequency. But since that's not what we're doing this evening, I'm gonna slow it back down, but it's so quickly, it's a frequency following effect and it happens so quickly that musicians know this intuitively if they don't know it intellectually. But when it comes to brain waves, 
most people had no idea that your brain also can be entrained, but instead of beats per minute, it's in beats per second. So the brain waves are slow frequencies. Let's say we're, right now we're about 10 cycles per second. After that first piece of music, we were down around eight cycles per second. We're gonna get a little deeper when we listen to deep theta, but automatically your brain follows the cues in the music. You don't even have to be consciously aware of it in the same way that subliminal affirmations work on your subconscious mind because our brains are such uh, sophisticated and subtly sensitive organs, it perceives things that we don't consciously uh, become aware of. Just like peripheral vision, you can be aware of something that you're not looking at out of the side of your eye in the same way that we can tune in with music. Well, uh, interestingly, when I got my Grammy nomination, the Grammys uh, called me up and Billboard called me up and said, you know, you have a spelling error on the front of your album. I said, no, I don't. They said, you spelled entertainment wrong. So I had to teach the Grammys and to teach the people at Billboard that there's a concept called entrainment where an external stimulus will entrain, will cause uh, your own body, your brain, your heartbeat to synchronize with the fundamental beat and rhythm of the music. And it can be very subtle. This happens with any music. You can feel your heartbeat whenever you listen to music and you'll find that your heartbeat is following the drummer. It's matching the drummer. In my music, that's not what we're typically working with. We're looking at opening the heart, opening, balancing the heart chakra, balancing the hemisphere of the brain. And when we have scales or lots of melody or the sorts of predictability, uh, as scientists have discovered, your left brain, the dominant hemisphere, is involved with analyzing structure, pattern recognition. So it's left brain dominant. And my perspective has always been, why would someone want to be half brain when you could be whole brain? It's a much more uh, beneficial state of consciousness and a way to proceed. The work of Dr. Maxwell Cade and so many other researchers point out that when you balance the hemispheres of the brain, you feel better. It actually liberates other uh, feel-good chemicals in the body, oxytocin uh, and uh, other uh, uh, neurohormones are secreted by the brain when you're in a state of balance that are, are very nurturing, to body, mind, and spirit, and literally helps you stay healthier. So the concept, not just of meditation, but stress reduction, there's so many similarities between the states of meditation, or certainly light meditation, and stress management and relaxation. Sometimes it's just the name you call it, but the process is the same. Allows your body and allows your immune system to function better. Literally, we support the action of your immune system when we get into a relaxed state. And in the state that we are now, and post, hopefully post-pandemic, but fundamentally, I believe we all need to take responsibility for our own health. And I know we see it now, people uh, in California, all over the United States, probably in Canada too, as soon as they could take off the mask, they're doing exactly what they did before. And uh, there may be a safer way to activate that. But in any case, what you could do for yourself is to amplify and support your own immune system and getting into a relaxed state, as Dr. Herbert Benson wrote in his best-selling book, The Relaxation Response, back in the 1970s, that is legal, it's inexpensive, and you could do it yourself. Those are all reasons I wanted to get, to learn how to get relaxed and get into meditative states because I was starting to uh, manifest some of the diseases of 
having too much stress and not dealing with my stress at an early age. And I had my holistic doctor say, you can either learn to manage your stress or you can start paying a lot of money to me and other doctors. That got my attention right away. And uh, it's how I've been living my life ever since. Well, let's see if we have any questions. Are we ready for a question yet, Janet? Or shall I just sure continue? Are. Yeah, we sure are. And uh, okay. thank you, Stephen. So here's the first question. And that is, do you record any of your music type with any rhythm tracks? Great question. And the answer is yes. But uh, most of the time, what happens is, uh, and what's happened over the years, is the stores and the distributors will say, people know you as Mr. Meditation Music. So uh, they wouldn't read the liner notes and say, even with an album called Drum Spirit, which has a Native American peace chief, uh, Sonny, uh, Chief Sonny Rayner, playing the grandfather drum and the grandfather rattles, they still wanted that to be no drums. And I said, well, you know, I have 50 albums that don't have drums, but I have uh, percussion on my album with Paul Horn from 1985 called Connections. And I have several other albums that have uh, drums and percussion. And I'll be putting out some more in, in the near future. But I had to take a lot of them off the market because, believe it or not, people got very upset they wouldn't read the description of the albums. And that's when we still had albums that had liner notes so you could read what it was about. And uh, they would say, I bought this album and it doesn't help me meditate. And I said, it says right in the album, this is not for meditation, but they didn't read. So I can't help that. So I, uh, and the stores would say, we only have room for four of your albums. If we put this rhythmic one up there, it's not gonna sell. We want only the albums that sell. And uh, the advantage now of the streaming platforms is all of my albums, even albums from the 1970s and the early 80s are now available. People are finding them. I didn't put them up there, but they're up there. They're on YouTube. Some of that is illegal, but they're up there. And you could find some of the albums, but uh, on my website, I will have a list coming up uh, after this question in the near future of uh, these are the albums that have percussion. And I, in fact, one of my secrets is that, in fact, we're going to hear one of the songs in the Deep Theta video that began by me playing with a percussionist on grand piano. Then we brought in Michael Manring on bass and then I took out the drums and had a whole other song that functioned perfectly as itself. So you would never know that there was a drum part that went to it, but that's how it was originally recorded. It's one of the secrets and many times I just go in there, no drums is just right into the zone, but sometimes playing with the rhythm, uh, particularly the, the drum parts that I like and that I use, uh, get me into the zone. So I have, even back when I was in college, I started to get my list of certain drum patterns, certain bass patterns that I could bring into my bands or that I could use in my recordings that worked for me. I was the first member of my audience. So if it could get me into the zone and coming back from the jazz world, that was a word that we would call it. If you're playing in the zone, you're beyond just thinking about the notes, you're playing on automatic. That was the highest state that you're uh, aiming for, where you're not thinking, you're just being, you're just playing. In the same way that when you're listening, you're not trying to analyze, you're just becoming the music. And that's my experience. And yes, sometimes some of the most powerful experiences have been uh, with percussion and also in person with, with uh, percussion. So that's a long answer to your question. Thank you for asking. Great. We're going to get on to some music in a bit, but I've just got a question here, Stephen. Uh, how did you move from being a jazz artist to a new age artist? That's a great, great question. Uh, I was following my bliss early on. I started getting involved in jazz and improvisation in high school. And uh, I was playing trumpet primarily and guitar. Guitar was more rock and roll and a little bit of blues, but jazz was primarily trumpet. Uh, got to college, had some incredible uh, teachers like legendary jazz bassist, uh, Ron Carter. 
and thought that was going to be my career for a while as the uh, up and coming jazz trumpet player, particularly after I uh, came to California. But my trip to California actually was an accident because my band was recording in New York. Uh, we uh, had a situation where suddenly the producer changed all the agreements and wanted us to play music that wasn't our own. Oh, we're not quite there yet. Or maybe we are. Hold on just a second. Yeah. Uh, so the key there was I hopped a flight to California for two weeks and with the intent to check out the jazz scene in, Calif uh, in California, San Francisco, go back to grad school studying ethnomusicology, uh, healing music around the world, multicultural manifestations and expressions of healing music and higher consciousness through music. That was a very left brain concept, take back into grad school. But I had an experience uh, visiting Santa Cruz out in the mountain, mountains, went to a Zen center and found myself in a redwood forest and suddenly it was in a very deep meditation and I started hearing the new music and uh, was not, and I also heard a message that said, this is the music that you've been praying to hear because I had been on an intention to know what healing music was gonna be for the 20th century, like in ancient Egypt, in ancient China. That was what I was reading about. And I wanted to hear what, what music would, would be healing in the this 1969 in the, in the 20th century. Uh, I found myself shortly thereafter in a room. I went to the wrong building. There was no one there, but there was a piano. I sat down and started playing the music that I had never played before. And when people wandered into the room, it was a place that I was auditioning for a job. Uh, they said, where did you learn to play like that? And I didn't know what to say because when I'm in channeling mode and I'm in that zone, I'm not hearing the music. But then I started recording on little cassette players and little reel to -reel players, And that's how I learned. And the feedback I got was forget trumpet. Forget, you know, the jazz. We need music to help us relax. We need music to help us do yoga for massage. My first concerts were for massage therapists to give them a soundtrack to do their massage. And I'm going, wait a minute, what about the piano player? Who's going to massage him? How do I get massaged with music? So that, that was part of how I started recording. But it was, it was from meditation and an experience in another dimension or however we want to say it. And over the years, and I've had a lot of confirmation through past life readings and other situations that this was indeed my calling. This was my path with heart. With heart. It was my, my follow my bliss. And uh, the hardest part was to learn about business. The music was the easy part. But uh, since 1969, in, uh, the end of November, that's what I've been pursuing. So thank you for asking. Great. So Stephen, we've got quite a few really good questions here, but I'm thinking maybe we should, uh, we've got another Q&A coming up after uh, this piece, so maybe we'll save those for the next one. What's okay. Your... Yep. Well, why don't we just do one, one more piece now, and then we'll come back and we'll do, uh, do some more Q&A, so we'll, we'll go back and forth. Uh, and this one uh, is, are we now up to Deep Theta? No, the Deep Alpha. Deep Alpha, good. So this one is Deep Alpha 2.0 which is the follow-up to Deep Alpha. And this one features Shakuhachi and Bansurai, features the meditative instruments of Japan and tapping into the acoustic way of, uh, of Zen with my electric piano uh, featuring the great musician Jorge Alfano. And uh, I'll let the music say the rest.
And as we come back, if you haven't already done so, just close your eyes a moment and go inside. Become aware of the space inside your chest, around the heart chakra, the space between your ears, between your temples. You might feel that your head is lighter on your neck. You might feel that you're actually sitting up straighter as the body begins to literally tune itself as a nervous system gets tuned, your physical structure gets tuned as well. So that uh, video is one of my most recent videos. And I just finally, after about 20 years of trying to get some footage from the dancer, uh, got a little bit of footage from something that she had recorded with some other people in Miami. We've appeared in some concerts in the Miami area. She's also a uh, a Qigong master, an acupuncturist, as well as obviously an incredible dancer. Uh, and Jorge Alfano is another musician I met at a conference. And uh, from the first time we played together on stage, we were like, wow, we've got to do some, some more playing together. So he's featured on a lot of my albums with Bansurai, the Indian flute, bamboo flute, and Shakuhachi, a master of both the Japanese flute. And uh, I was just delighted. So uh, that's part of what makes the Deep Alpha 2.0 and the Deep Theta 2.0 different than every song on the 2.0s have a flute and no songs on the original versions have flute. So if you like flute, you're gonna wanna pick up on that one. So that's, uh, uh, remembering how it was recorded, if you hear the low note, the low drone, the entrainment tones are mixed very subtly into that drone. So I'm listening to that when I'm recording my electric piano. Jorge is listening to that when he's playing his flute to my electric piano. So we are all having our brains entrained to the same frequencies. And when you listen, you naturally are entrained in the same way. So there we go. Time for another question. Yeah, thank, thank you, Stephen. And uh, we really wanted to make this evening a music and also interactive and also for you to share some of your sound healing knowledge. So we so appreciate what you're doing so far. Great. Uh, so a question I have here is, how would you say your own personal exposure to such resonant music has affected your intuition? Interesting question. Uh, it's, a, it's a loop, it's a feedback loop. It's not either or. In fact, as I've been working on my memoir for the last uh, couple of years in, uh, and now finally making more progress, uh, what I find is that it's a feedback loop where sometimes the music will trigger an opening of intuition and sometimes the intuition will take me to a different place in music. So uh, both uh, are, are very helpful and a lot of the breakthroughs for me have actually happened in the studio. And even though there's no one else to witness it other than myself and the engineer, it's recorded. Most of my albums, we don't have a video camera going. Uh, for me, it's distracting to have a, a video camera guy or two going around. And uh, up until recently, videos were not that big a deal, you know, in the, in the 70s or 80s. And um, so, but the intuition is always, and I get inspired from a lot of different places. But uh, when I was in Egypt, I was uh, and being inside the pyramid and being at Abydos and some of the other temples uh, that stimulated uh, memory banks that I didn't even know I had, but I had a feeling they were there, but I would wound up uh, in several places, going places that were off limits. And when I was arrested in some cases and got out of that, they said, how did you even know to go there? I said, I just followed the energy. I just followed, maybe I've been here before. 
And uh, when you say that to a guy with a submachine gun, you get a strange look, but he said, okay, you can leave now. And one of those was on the uh, full moon uh, in March, uh, March 28th in 1980, meditating between the paws of the Sphinx, which I thought would be a great place to meditate and amp up my intuition. It was for the first 10 minutes and then became very dangerous. And uh, luckily I had extra money stuck into my socks and uh, that was the other way we were able to get uh, home safely back to the hotel that day. So yet yeah, uh, the music uh, I often find when I am in the deepest states and playing, and that was another thing I noticed early on, it's a lot easier to stay in a meditative state playing a keyboard than it is playing a trumpet where you have to have your embouchure and you have to have your diaphragm support with keyboards you're just right there. And then the other part of uh, recording is the mixing and the fine tuning and the editing. And those also get into a state where sometimes intuition will happen in dreams. A lot of times as I'm listening, uh, and sometimes I'll be listening as I'm driving, and I will just suddenly get a download and say, oh, I need to change that note, or I need to add this instrument over here and as soon as I know something or hear something, I could take that into the studio and recreate that. I get ideas in dreams. Bring that into the studio, recreate it. So I usually don't write very much down. Once it's there, it's kind of like a photographic memory. It allows me to get back into that state. And that's, again, the bottom line. It's state related. I learned early on, in fact, as I mentioned, some of this goes back to the, the early jazz days. If you get yourself into the right frame of mind, it's even easier to practice. And for you know people like myself who didn't really like to practice, the only way that I could get practicing for eight hours a day, which I did in the summer of 1968 and 69, was to really get in and be in that state. And that's when I made my musical quantum leap from being a good musician to being someone that could play with anybody on any stage in, in the fields that I uh, work in. So here's a comment and a question, Stephen. Hey. In 89, I was privileged to attend several days of a John Bradshaw workshop in Seattle. Yes. Such a gift, the music and the sessions. But one of the exercises you had us participate in was playing different types of music jazz, hip hop, etc., to discover what rhythms turned us off and what aligned with our body rhythm. Would you please comment on those body rhythms? Are you saying that I, I was in charge of that part? Yeah, that's the comment here, yeah. Huh. Well, I don't remember that. I don't <laughs> remember ever playing hip hop in any Bradshaw event, uh, but I might have played I certainly might have played some things on piano where I would demonstrate certain things. But, but what I also would do would demonstrate muscle testing uh, that by playing certain rhythms, whether I'm clapping it out with my hands or playing on the piano, I could strengthen your muscles and keep your thing or make it so weak. I could take one finger and press your arm down. So in other words, the, the rhythms that you're listening to uh, have an amazing effect on your body's energy. Now, you don't wimp out if you're listening to a certain kind of rock or certain kind of uh, other kind of music, but uh, myself and Dr. John Diamond, who did a lot of research in this field, found out that a lot of music has a basic rhythm that's opposite to the beat of the heart. And that put stress on the nervous system and weakens your body. But then your body will pull energy from other places. And um, so you don't walk around depleted all day, but that's why people will drink more coffee a lot of times because the music they're listening to is actually, they think it's energizing them, but it's actually draining them on some level, particularly if there are some things in the rhythm and some drummers uh, could be rock drummers or jazz drummers, Right off the bat, they may sound similar, but if you listen to a song like uh, Phil Collins, Something in the Air Tonight, a great song, a super hit. If you listen to the drum sound, 
And so this would be part of your homework. You listen to the dunk dunk ba on the snare drum. There's what's called the reverse noise gate. You will hear the sound be sucked away. Dun, dun, dun. And that is also sucking away energy. So that creates an addictive response in the music. Now, you may still like it. If you're moving to it, then you're bringing body energy and you're moving the energy. But if you're just sitting around listening to music like that, your body is getting stressed without you knowing it. So in 1989, that might have been what I did, but I don't remember ever playing examples of hip hop because I, when I used to try that in, work, in my own workshops, it was so detrimental to me that I just would talk about it. I wouldn't play examples uh, in the same way that I don't play examples of music. This is an, uh, some music to put you to sleep. I don't do that in live performances. And uh, uh, there are certain other kinds of music. Uh, and some music is obvious, uh, heavy metal, death metal. There are some great musicians doing that, but the energy and the consciousness this is another very important point, that the consciousness of the performer is transmitted through the music to the listener. So if, whether it's classical music or heavy metal, if you are stressed uh, when you're playing, as many classical performers are, because they're afraid of making a wrong note, uh, that stress is transmitted to the audience in live performance and even on recordings. Dr. Diamond researched 20 different, uh, 20,000 different recordings and had his own database of that. And the same piece by Mozart played by different people. One could be uplifting. They would sound very similar, but the energy in four out of five would be weakening to the body. This, so the same thing, if it's rock, if it's Ringo Starr, the Beatles had a drummer who was uplifting. A lot of his rhythms might sound like somebody else, but someone else, it'll weaken you. So that's probably what we were talking about in 1989. And that was a great, great uh, uh, time up in Seattle, as I recall. Great. So Stephen, we, um, we have one more question here before great. we go into a, a long piece. There's gonna be three pieces here the, okay. that you're going to to introduce us to. But this question is, at what age did you come to know that music would be your mission? Uh, it would have been that day in 1969. So I was uh, 22 years old, but what I was told, uh, which included uh, three years later during the biofeedback research that I was doing as part of my graduate studies, uh, the researchers said uh, the results were so dramatic. This is no longer just your research project. This is your life. You need to get this information. You need to get this music out to the public. Well, if you're a starving graduate student, you have no money, no business acumen, no training, and uh, no staff or anything, you know, well, thank you very much, but I don't know what that means. I, I have no idea how to even begin with that. But things unfolded. I would meet people who would give me some ideas. And, and then I made my first album and uh, uh, had a thousand LPs that were delivered. In fact, this was the album. Let me reach down. This was my very first album that came with one of the pictures of the biofeedback, the curling photograph of a leaf that we were studying as well as fingertips uh, and bioenergy in the biofield in the laboratory. Uh, that uh, I still had no idea how they would manifest, but I was told that the music would be heard worldwide. And I had no idea how that would manifest. In 1970, in fact, we'll just take, take a second. It was at the Vancouver uh, first mega conference, the World Symposium of Humanity in 1976, I think it was October, October or November, uh, as I was playing my music and uh, demonstrating uh, the album, two wonderful women from England said, we're putting on the biggest show in Europe. It's called the Festival of Mind, Body, Spirit in London. We'd love to have you present your music and do part of a concert there. So I said, sure. That got me over to Europe. And from even that first time in April 1977, I had people from Africa coming over and say, oh, we love your music in Nigeria. I'm going, how did you even find it in Nigeria? 
How did it get there? No idea. So that was my first real proof and confirmation that the music was really making a difference. And I started getting letters from people that were just mind blowing on, on how much of an impact the music would have. When I met John Bradshaw, he was, the first thing he said is, your music has had such an impact on my life, it helps me work my program of recovery. And he would say that publicly. And I didn't even know what that meant at that point. Uh, and I quickly learned how important that was, that with music that helps you attain the inner silence, that balance your, balances the hemispheres of your brain, a lot of uh, addicts are trying to get to that sense of balance, but through a dysfunctional way. So that was when I really started knowing. And now with the uh, onset of the streaming revolution and iTunes and having music digitally available all the place, it's around the world. Uh, every, every week I get playlists from one of the uh, services that I subscribe to. I'm number one on this playlist in Lithuania, number one in Moldavia, places I can't even find on a map that people are listening to my music. Certainly I know in Russia, because I was there in 1987 and uh, there was a great number of people that were really opening up to it. But others in Russia in 1987, when Glasnost was starting, they said, we cannot listen to your music because it's so beautiful. It reminds us of how terrible it is outside. So that was 30 years ago. Things are better now, maybe. And, Whatever. But that's when I really knew this was not just a California, a new age uh, thing, or even just related to the unity movement or other thing. This was across the board. And I have corporate wellness people, and I've been at business seminars with some of the CEOs who take me aside and say, I can't say this publicly, but I listen to your music all the time. It's part of my competitive advantage. I don't want to tell my rivals my business rivals, that this is part of my secret to helping me get balanced. Because when I listen to this music, when I get into the alpha state, and they know about all this state, I'm more creative. Being in the alpha state and then in the theta state, it enhances your intuition. And that is part of uh, the secret of a lot of the best CEOs and, uh, and the high level executives. So my uh, outreach through just the music, as well as being at, uh, invited to speak at a lot of the conferences, the mind body sound uh, conferences. I was the first ones. I've been at every uh, body, mind, and spirit uh, conference with the, the whole life expos and the new life expos, and a lot of the ones that we've done the last year through, uh, through Zoom. So, I through starting in 1977, I was on the road pretty much three or four weekends every month. And the feedback I would get from Tulsa, Oklahoma, from uh, Akron, Ohio, from, from Miami, from New York, was that this is music that's touching people all over the country, no matter their, uh, their background or religious persuasion or race or creed, all those things, the music touched someplace. And that's of course the eternal spirit and the silence within. And we all share that same soul moment. So that's, that's when I knew, and that's when uh, I started saying, okay, I've been getting asked to write a memoir. Now I could honestly say, okay, this is what I was told, but until it was real, I didn't want to put that out into the world. Now it's real. I can say, these were the people that told me that. Here is something that I was shown in 1979 and took all this time, but now it's manifested. And having said that, why don't we go to the next piece of music? And this one will be are we up to, uh, which one are we up to now? We've got, we've got three pieces, Stephen, that you right. were going to introduce because they're uh, more right. relaxed. and Right, so, so this is uh, Deep Theta. Yes. Okay, so now we're going. So now, as you watch. Nope, that's Deep Alpha. There we go. That's what we're looking for. And this Steven, one. Steven, yes. did you want to introduce all three pieces so we don't have to take an interruption? Let's do that now. Yes. Okay. So with Deep Theta, yeah. you actually see me play the music live. This one, we did set up a camera uh, and then I made the engineer get back in the, in 
by, by his console. So it's just me in the room and getting into the zone. Uh, obviously, the imagery behind me, I was not seeing that because we weren't projecting that. Uh, and it just comes from a very deep place. And then when Michael Manring, great bassist, came into overdub uh, sometime afterwards, that's when the piece totally came together. Now, the second piece is uh, a shorter piece. And let's see if I could read in the dark here. This is uh, a short version of Amazing Grace, which I played a lot with, certainly with Bradshaw. I've played this in front, uh, at a lot of memorial services. It's one I get asked to play a lot. So this is just a brief version of that, but it's my, what we used to call the anti-frantic version. It's uh, not a linear, strict, rhythmic aspect. It allows you to get into the space and hear the beautiful electric piano, which you see me playing. This is not a synthesizer. It's actually a series of tuning forks played by uh, the keyboard, little hammers that hit it inside, picked up electrically. And that's why it produces such a beautiful sound. And then I play uh, an uh, extended version of Green Sleeves, variations upon the theme. I'll start You'll recognize it, but I don't play it in the usual uh, way uh, that Green Sea is Green played. It's, it's a, uh, an ancient folk song, of course. It goes back to the Middle Ages. It's usually played with a very strict rhythm. I take many uh, liberties with that and go into the flow. Interestingly, I'll just mention that uh, back in 1982, uh, there was somebody who tried to sue me saying I copied their version of Green Sleeves. Uh, it was great. I was really looking forward to going to court because their version has cannon, has drums, has all sorts of things in a strict three, four time. And it was clear that those lawyers had no idea what they were talking about. And I was actually really looking forward to uh, doing a little New York trip on them. But they realized the error of their ways. And uh, this green sleeves picks up on that. And then feeling the energy of the audience that night, I just uh, went into some little uh, fantasies and then we take it back. So you could feel the energy. And again, uh, there's nowhere else you need to go right now. Just allow yourself to focus, tune in, and we'll see you in a couple of minutes for the next Q&A.
Yes, I remember when I performed that, it was very hard to speak after that performance. That was one of my favorite all time versions of Greensleeves. And the people at that church who have heard that piano said the piano has never sounded like that before. That was where the sound waves, I could almost see them. There was one of, one of the things that's so wonderful about uh, buildings and rooms and churches and, and places that people have gathered uh, is that there are standing waves of energy that accumulate and resonate and build up over time. So that when I play in an environment like that, I'm riding on the energy of so many people who've been there before. And then in attendance, we have the people in the room that we can see. But one of the other things, and one of the questions that uh, we had earlier is that I also learned that at my concerts, there are a lot of beings that you can't see. Most people can't see them, but I've had enough aura readers come up to me who would see the same thing sometimes behind me on stage and in the room that it's a concert for people with bodies and out of bodies. So it's uh, an interesting multidimensional opportunity. And, uh, you know, we, we know the old, vision of angels playing music in heaven. Well, you don't have to wait till you get to heaven. They enjoy music down here also. And it's, it's, uh, it's where it is and the energy of upliftment and having people get into that state. When I mentioned the Deep Theta recording, that was the first session that I did as a, it began as a research project using the brainwave entrainment matrix and starting off at eight cycles per second and doing a seven cycle per second, a six cycle per second, a five cycle per second, and a four cycle per second to get my brain waves into specific states of theta. And for me, when I got to the four hertz, the four cycles per second, suddenly the music was like in Technicolor. And it just came to me. I didn't have to think about anything more, even more, more dramatically than usual. And some of the phrases that I played, I had never played before. So it was just a, uh, uh, I felt like I was levitating off the piano bench while I was doing it. I had a hard time keeping my hands, actually still playing the notes. So that's, that energy is also encoded into the video and before we get to the Q&A, the video that we saw before with the Deep Alpha 2.0, no one else has ever seen that yet. It's not public yet. So you are the first audience to have seen that and the first people to have seen the amazing goddess dancer, uh, Lisa Lumiere. And um, uh, so thank you for sharing that. So I, I wanted to mention that, that that is an exclusive tonight. Thank you, Stephen. So um, we're, we're probably going to be going till about nine minutes, I mean, 12 minutes after nine. So we're going to just take, we've got, we've got a, one question here, Stephen, and then we're going to go to some two beautiful uh, pieces at the end here and, and another piece. So the question is, do you have any specific technical advice for someone meditating to your music and wanting to drop into the slower brainwave states like theta or even conscious delta? Well, conscious delta, that's, that's a tricky one. I'll, I'll come back and discuss that in a minute. But theta, the obvious answer is get and listen to the deep theta album. And ideally, listen with headphones, uh, close your eyes, there's nowhere else you need to go and automatically you will be getting into that place. And then uh, particularly on that album and also on Deep Alpha, tracks 13 and 14 of each album are more ambient. There's less melody, there's less keyboard notes and just more of what actually what I was listening to, what we call the, the bed, the, uh, 
the drone tones, the entrainment, and the harmonic basis that I build everything else on. But if you meditate with that, and that's often what I listen to myself, uh, if I only have five minutes to meditate, I put that on, and as soon as I meditate, I know I'm in theta. I don't have to wait 20 minutes to get into a meditative state. And uh, as a, you know, an adult ADA uh, person on, on the functional part of the spectrum, I don't want to wait 20 minutes to get relaxed. I don't want to wait 20 minutes to get into a meditative state. I want to hit it and get right into the zone. And that's part of why I did that music for me first, and then seeing how it react, uh, affected other people said, this is the beginning of an album. So that's what I'd recommend. Uh, shutting down the visual, focusing on the sound. You can be sitting up, you could be lying down, but what you say conscious delta, uh, delta is the frequencies between one, two, and three cycles per second. Those are the frequencies uh, most characteristic of sleep. So even in the studio, when we thought we were, when we were mixing the music and editing and adding and making the final uh, fade outs, many times the engineer would have to poke me because I would zone out, I would fall asleep in the studio at three o'clock in the afternoon. So I don't know if we would call that conscious delta, but uh, for meditation, four hertz, five hertz, six, seven, that's where you want to stay with, with theta. Maybe you're one of the few who could stay awake uh, with three hertz in, in delta, but uh, most people, and certainly do not drive with any of these theta or delta uh, soundtracks. Alpha, if you're used to it, you, uh, some people can drive with it. If you're not in big traffic, if you're on a country road and there's no traffic, it enhances the scenery. But you, you want to be uh, not doing that with the theta. Uh, I've tried that since I know the music better than anyone. And uh, driving down to uh, uh, one of the lectures that I give at uh, East West Books in Mountain View, it's about two hours away. Uh, I passed, I've gone there for 20 years. I passed the exit and I was 10 miles past it before I realized, where am I? Driving perfectly, but I was in the theta zone. Not good for driving, good for other things. Perfect. Okay. Stephen, this is uh, just, uh, just been incredible so far and we've got uh, a couple more things to, to introduce to people here. So. Uh, if you'd like to introduce the next. Uh... I would, but, but I'm getting a, a vibe. I bet there's one, if we could go maybe to 9.15, a couple more minutes, one other quick question that I could answer quickly. Is there one other good one there? Um, yes, there is one. I, I bet for next time, and if people have other questions that they didn't get asked, maybe you could forward them to me and I could uh, send some answers and then you could. Beautiful. Uh, they could contact you or you'll figure out how to let them know how they could get uh, an answer to that that we didn't okay. get to. Uh, so we're yeah. going to go till 9.15. And here's the question. Um, this person refers to the symphony of grace that seems to flow through you. And they want to know, are you ever personally amazed at how this flows through you as a symphony of grace? Oh, boy. <laughs> I, if you could see the hair standing up, all over me now. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Uh, from from the beginning, and there have been so many times, uh, and there's sometimes even in the studio when the engineer says, this room feels holy now. There have been some moments that were just transformational, and there's no one to witness, just me and the engineer, but we know what happened, and then we could hear it. Uh, you know, in the music. So yes, thank you for that question. Yeah, no, and that's and that's part of why I continue doing new albums because there are always new experiences, and that experience of grace is is. I mean, I, I don't want to say it's addictive, but it's so high and it's so fulfilling. It's uh, it's better than a thousand people clapping. It's I'm I'm levitating, and uh, thank you for that question. So yes. 
Thank you, Stephen. And I'm sure we'll have many more. So thank you for offering to answer those questions that come through the chat that we aren't able to get to this evening. Great. So to introduce the last two pieces, we have uh, one that was recorded at a sound healing conference where I'm playing uh, at the end of one song that had rhythm, then the rhythm track faded out and I continued because I was so inspired that I did some of the work with the synthesizer. So you'll see that. And then the la uh, and then we also have uh, Ocean of Bliss, which uh, I recorded as I often do on the anniversary of my first day in the studio. So that was January 4, 1975. So on January 4, 2019, uh, I went in uh, to the studio, made an appointment with uh, my guides and my invisible band and the engineer. And uh, some very interesting music came, by, uh, came through. It didn't knock me out when I did it, but then when I listened to playback, it was, wow, when did that happen? He said, you just recorded it, but I didn't know it in that moment. So that also ties in with the question before. And uh, so those are the two piece, uh, pieces we're gonna hear. Uh, Ocean of Bliss is my new album, just actually won uh, Album of the Year Award at the uh, Coalition of Visionary uh, re, uh, Retailers and Resources, uh, a big uh, alternative new age marketing group. So I was very uh, honored uh, two weeks ago to win that award for that album. Uh, it's a, a very gentle album obviously features a beautiful, relaxing ocean sound with entrainment. So again, you're gonna be in the alpha state and the eight Hertz ties you in with the Schumann resonance, the basic fundamental frequency of the planet of about eight cycles per second. And uh, there's nowhere else you do, you just need to uh, enjoy some uh, ambient uh, imagery. And here we go. <laughs> 